Hey everyone, my name is Christine Kreischer. I'm one of the pastors at GT Church and your host for the Growing Together podcast, where we bring you new episodes every Wednesday to give you a midweek boost of encouragement and inspiration that will motivate you to live out your faith, to put it into practice. Today, we're hanging out with Pastor Brian Cup. If you missed this past Sunday, you want to go back and watch it for sure. It was a celebration of the 33 years that Brian has served as the uh, as pastor at GT Church, 29 of those as the lead pastor. It was an incredible celebration, Brian, of your ministry and the impact that you have made on not just our church and not just our community, but around the world. Uh, we talked about the, the beginning years, we talked about the building years, and we talked about the legacy years. Brian, you have really, you are leaving behind an incredible legacy. One of the things that you said um, on Sunday was to, to leave a legacy, you have to live a legacy. And I can tell you right now from serving with you and knowing you for the past 20 years, it is apparent and that you have done that. Your fingerprints are all over GT. And so before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit more about legacy. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about Sunday. What was that like for you? What were you thinking? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was like surreal. Uh, it was exciting. And then it was just like, I just kept thinking about, man, how faithful God is. Like when you just see those old pictures, I know we always laugh and we talk about whatever, but it really like, cause no matter who you are, you just forget certain things. And we just seeing certain pictures. I'm like, so it was really surreal in many ways. Um, I thought the team did such a great job the way they, you know, trying to capture all that time and 30 minutes. So I was really impressed by our team and all that they did. Um, I think one of the, you know, the other thoughts that I, that I just had was like, yes, God has been faithful for 95 plus years to GT and to, to the church all over the world, but mm -hmm. certainly to us. But I was also thinking about how God, you know, how the people of God are faithful because I said it numerous times, like it, it's gotta be more than one person or five people or the board or the leadership. No, it's all of us living out um, God's calling on our life. And I just think of all the faithful people, like, you know, hearing, you know, uh, um, Bob Wales and Rachel Moyer, and just hearing these people that are just like, you know, we often talk about being pillars of the church, but they were, I don't know. I, I had a flood of emotion coming. I mean, I think at nine o'clock we were all a little, cause I didn't really know what was happening. So I was sitting there a little bit more, uh, tightened up than I usually am. I'm usually pretty loose and whatever at the 11 o'clock we, I think everyone loosened up, which was good. Mm -hmm. But, uh, overall it was such, um, I don't know. It really, none of us like to be in that seat where it's being, but at the same time, I think the Romans 13, you guys honored me and, a, and my family uh, and the church in general. And so it was a, it was a great day. It was uh, I just thought a lot about it. Of course, people were, you know, texting me after the service, whatever. And um, yeah, it was a, it was a great day. I, I loved it. It's and my funny. boys, my boys, it was just really interesting to me as a dad mm. hearing my boys you know, talk about it. Cause that's, that was their whole world. That's all. That's the only way in that, you know, what I did with my life is how they knew that. And uh, so they were, it was really interesting just to hear their comments. Like it was so good, you know, uh, they were so, they were greatly impacted by it as well, for sure. Wow. Hmm. And your response really makes me think of your legacy, right? Part of a big part of who you are was it, you, you just have this mentality of it's not about me. It's, mm -hmm. It's about the team you've led with such a, an incredible team approach. And, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things Scott talked about it on Sunday when, when we had our last all staff with you last week and everybody went around, all of our staff went around and just okay. talked about the impact that you've made on their lives. There really was that common theme of we, not me, right? right. You yeah. always like your legacy is you see people you see their potential and you equip and empower them to step into God's calling on their life and God's purpose for their life. And um, I, I think a, another huge part of that is your passion for people and for people to experience what it really looks like to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. Right. Um, and we didn't really talk about this, but you wrote a book with um, co-authored a book with uh, Daniel McNaughton. Was that in 2010? Uh, 2011, I believe was 11. the first edition. We did a second edition. The first edition was in 2011, a okay. year before we developed our strategic plan. And it was kind of, you know, really insightful creating that. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I know your passion has always been discipleship. As a matter of fact, I was going through, so I've been attending GT for 20, since 1997. Yeah. And this book right here, I could probably auction this off and make a lot of money. (laughs) That was a precursor to follow for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, We're going to do that at the end of the uh, podcast today, but no, this is, um, this is something that you wrote the dynamics of discipleship. Yep. Um, this was prior to you writing the book follow like, Yep. I want to say, was this from the 80s, maybe 90s? That would have been from oh, the early 90s, early like 90s. right after I was lead pastor, 92, 93. It was right out of the gate. Yep. Yeah. And this was your heart for helping yep. people help coming, come alongside of people to help them understand what it means to be a fully devo- devoted follower of Jesus. Um, yeah, because with that, I mean, we always were wanting to reach the lost and evangelize, but there was another book even before that called the dynamics of nurturing. Cause you know, it's like the steps. It was almost like first steps and then follow. It was like, you know, we got to nurture people and just, you know, Hey, accept them right where they are. And, and just realize, you know, I, I remember telling stories about like, as people would get insight from the Holy spirit when we all have had that, cause we, we didn't know God. And so we took steps and, uh, so yeah, the dynamics of nurturing and discipleship, those were kind of a precursor to what the need of the church is, and that's to make disciples. Yeah. I think I remember hearing you say once that following Jesus shouldn't be hard, right? right. Because right. I remember I didn't grow up in church. And yep. so when I, I, I remember coming to GT for about a year and a half and hiding out in the backgrounds because just feeling stupid. I don't know anything. Yep. Um, and gosh, there's so much more I could say about that, but just feeling overwhelmed. And I would listen to you right. talk about the Bible and I would listen to you talk about your prayer life and all of these things. And I would think I can never do right. that. I can never be like that. It felt so unattainable for me. Um, and then even when you helped to pair me with a mentor, mm-hmm. I didn't even know what to ask. I didn't know, you know what I mean? You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, that's and right. so that's this book, The Dynamics of Discipleship, helped me to like, just t- like you said, take those steps. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, it's not hard to follow Jesus. But then when you wrote follow, and this is actually um, not the latest version, but I've got like all my awesome notes and yep. highlights and stuff in here. Um, so it's hard to let go of, but this was a huge because it laid out seven, seven attributes. So talk a little bit about follow and why you um, decided to write it. And yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, it it ties right back to our mission because, you know, um, GT was reaching people. There's no doubt about it. We were doing some unique outreach in our community and people were being drawn and thank God giving their life to Christ. And again, it goes back to those, that booklet you first showed, like I realized, you know, the Bible says that even the demons believe in Jesus, Mm -hmm. they tremble about it, but it's so I knew I was never called and the church was never called just to make believers. And so, Oh, you know, but we're called to make disciples. And so uh, we were reaching people, but I, I felt like, man, are they growing in Christ? Are they, are they learning to pray? Are they taking steps in their faith? Because we know not only the enemy of our souls, but this world, everything works against us growing spiritually. And so we can have that feeling of being overwhelmed. And I, I, I felt the same way that you did. I, I hadn't read the Bible. And I think a lot of it was my background. I really got saved. I gave my heart to Christ. No one, they said, basically, here was my discipleship. Um, you need to go to church. You need to pray and read your Bible. And you just, you know, you pick up this book and it's overwhelming. Like you really want to know who God is. And you've heard me tell the story of opening to Zechariah. I thought, man, if someone would have just said, read the gospels, read John, yeah. Um, learn about Jesus. And that's really some of the foundational pieces of follow. And um, so, yeah, I was so glad to be a part of that. I thought, man, we can, we can reach thousands of people, but if we're not helping them grow in their faith, then we're really not doing our job. And you said, keeping it simple, sometimes the church, not knowing, I think not fully aware, we make it more complicated. Yeah. Than it needs Good to be. Intentions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And then that's what happens. People feel stupid. They feel overwhelmed and then they go, okay. And they give up yeah, and right. I think follow for so many people. It's, it's just been that lifeline of on two, two fronts, right? So one for the new believer, but also I remember feeling compelled to share my faith. I felt compelled to help other people learn how to follow Jesus. Like what that, that what that looked like, but I, I didn't have a manual, right? I didn't have the, right. the framework for that. And so talk a little bit about that, that how is Follow designed to be read? 
Yeah, um, that's a great point um, because that's that's how it is. Now, when you start taking some steps and you're growing, now you want to share it with others. And I think one of the biggest things that hinders the church and believers in that is fear. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start this conversation and someone's going to ask me a question and I'm not going to know the answer to that. Yeah. And one of the things we talk about and follow is that that's okay. Just be authentic and say, you know what? That's a great question. And I don't know that I have the answer for that. So let's mm-hmm. explore that together. Let's, let's talk to somebody else. Let's look at the Bible verses that say, maybe that speak to that. So I think a lot of times people get fearful that if I, like, I'm not going to pray out loud. I'm not going to pray in front of people. I'm not going to share my faith because what if someone asks me a valuable question and I don't know the answer? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so one of the things we say and follow right off the bat is there's no stupid questions. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you think of Peter, okay, who's a great example, sticks his foot in his mouth nonstop, really loves God, but doesn't have it all figured out. He's a fisherman. That's what he knows. And now Jesus says, look, follow me and I'm going to make you fisher of men. Mm -hmm. Peter didn't know what that was about. But when you think about Peter in the gospels, and then you think about him in first and second Peter, that he literally was crucified upside down. That's a long stretch between oh, I'm going to go back to fishing and I'm done with this, you know, uh, to now I'm going to give my life for Jesus Christ. There's a lot of steps. Mm -hmm. And so I think you really hit on it that I think follow was meant to just like, number one, lay, not only give us more information, because a big deal in follow for me comes out of Matthew 7, because the whole book is written from the perspective of Matthew. So Matthew 7 says, you know, a wise man is someone who listens to Jesus and follows it, the NIV. Mm -hmm. or in the NLT. In the NIV, it says, those who listen to Jesus, listen to to these things and put them into practice. Being a Christian isn't just about more information uh, because sometimes that's where we get overwhelmed. It's just, it's this, it's the Old Testament, it's the new, it's all this. No, it's really just when God shows you something, don't get overwhelmed. Just that one thing he showed you, put it into practice. Mm -hmm. Just try to live that out. Mm -hmm. And if you mess up, then ask them to forgive you and try it again. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just really walking in God's grace. So it's designed, right? Grab a book, grab a book for a friend, sit down, walk through it together, right? And it becomes a manual. You write in it, you you, you make notes in it. And then this book, it's not like, I'm going to say, it's not like another book where you read it, put it in your shelf. Oh, that was, this now becomes your manual to do it with someone else. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because, and every time for me personally, I remember you took me for, through the book for the mm-hmm. first time. And I remember just thinking about, um, and I'm not a sports person, but I just love this analogy of Vince Lombardi. Every, you know, he was the winningest Super Bowl, win, winningest football coach, right? Yep. Of all time. Yep. Um, but every season, they just won the Super Bowl the start of every season, it didn't matter. He would hold up the football and he would say, guys, gather around, gather around this is a football, right? And he just right. talked about its foundations. And this book is the foundation, seven attributes of a follower of Jesus, but it's really like seven decisions. Isn't yeah, that's, it? Right. that's right. So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, that's exactly right. And I, I would just say that's so important. You have discipled so many and you've taken people through this and made sure they have that opportunity. Um, and you know, one of the big things is that you always learn from those that you disciple. No one ever becomes the know-all. Like every time I've taken a new believer through this, that's really passionate. That said, look, because I, there came a point where I said, look, the only way I'm going to take someone through it is if they have a heart to do this for someone else. Right. And I would learn so much because, you know, it's just like listening to that new Christian because we just take so much for granted. When you've been in this a while, Mm -hmm. you're like, you know, and we don't mean to do that, but you just think, oh, you know, I know how this, and you'd hear a new believer, like with tears running down their face or passionately saying like what God showed them, that stirs you. And I used to always say, and it was so true when I was discipling someone, which most of the time I was at least one or two, it changes the way you preach, the way you live, the way you interact with your kids. Cause it reminds you, I don't have this all figured out. And I do not want to become a Pharisee, a a Nicodemus who just, you know, I I become this master of the law, but I forget what it's like to really hear what Jesus is saying and put it into practice. Mm, That's so good. And it's so true. Your faith comes alive. We talked about that with Daniel Strickland on the podcast last week, where when you are actively engaged in the mission of God, something happens inside of you. And it's not about you teaching others or you giving to others, but as you give, you receive. And 
Yeah. And, and I thought about that when my, I remember my next door neighbor, young, young woman, single mom came to me one day. I had invited her to come to church, She came to church. And then she said to me, I'm confused. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to read the Bible. I don't know what to do. And I was like, come on, girl, let's get you a book. And we sat and she, then one day, one day, first session, she showed up with her cousin and she's like, can we get her a book too? And we sat on my back porch eight, you know, eight, nine, 10 times once a week. And we would just work through this together. And yes, they grew and there were some revelations for them, but I, it, it, oh, I loved it so much. And so, you know, such a uh, gift. Christine, you, you prayed exactly that before we started the podcast today. And the thought is like, everyone's at a different place. So you have this brand new believer that knows nothing about the Bible. And then they, then there's those who are starting to grow and they're starting to learn. And then there's people that have been in the faith for years. Mm -hmm. But again, if our hearts are right, whether you've served him three minutes or three years or 30 years, you're always open to God. You can never learn enough and get enough of God. And that really the first attribute is learning to be with Mm -hmm. Jesus. I love that. You know, when he appointed the disciples, uh, he said, look, your first appointment is to be with me, not to cast out devils, not to heal the sick, not to preach the gospel. As powerful as those things are, he, it, it says he appointed them to be with him. That's our first appointment to just be with Jesus and to spend time with him. You know, it's like being with a good friend and we are the friends of God. Mm-hmm. Um, to the, it's not like just, oh, I got to put this on my counter. I got to do it. No, I can't wait to, you, when there's people you love, you, you love hanging out with them, you know, mm-hmm. and that's how it ought to be with Jesus. And that first attribute, that's what we talk about. I love that so much because we live in a culture that is all about doing, right? We reward doing, we reward high capacity leaders. We reward like busyness. Yep. And it's busyness that actually keeps our relationship with Jesus on the surface, right? It robs us from really experiencing the presence of God because we're so quick. And I remember I felt this way, like when I first gave my life to Jesus and I just remembered thinking, okay, now what do I have to do? Right. How do I have, how do I have to pray? Where should I serve? What should, what should I do, 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 do? Like, uh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> that, was song. that was good. <laughs> but, um, but I remember you saying that it was that our time with Jesus for well, everything that we do, sorry, everything that we should, that we do should be an overflow from the time that we spend with that's Jesus, right. from our being with Jesus. That's right. When you, let's walk through each of the seven attributes. We'll, yep. we'll try to do this quickly. Um, yep. But if you would like summarize the attribute and you kind of just did that for me and then maybe talk about the part of the attribute that really speaks to you personally. And then if there's any resources, because the other thing about this book is there's tons of resources in the back of the book that are such practical, tangible walkaways that are so helpful for actually making these decisions and, and changing your life for the better. Yeah, it's so true. So like learning to be, you just said it, there's nothing wrong with being busy and effective, but it has to come out of being with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so one of the resources in the back of it just takes your week, 168 hours. And it just gives you a general idea, like um, what your roles are. You're a mom, you're a dad, you're a single parent, you're unemployed, you work two jobs, whatever it is, we all have 168 hours. I cannot tell you how many people I've discipled and say, Brian, I don't know. I just don't know that I have time to do this. I said, well, time out. You have 168 hours, just like I do. Maybe we need to reorganize some of that time. So learning to be with Jesus, which is critical, foundational, there's a resource that shows you how to do that. Mm -hmm. Learning to listen. Um, I think, again, the overwhelming feeling sometimes is we don't think about listening to God. We think about, well, how can I pray to God? Mm -hmm. What can I do for God? There's a real strength in just learning to listen. Mm -hmm. You've heard me say it a million times. I've never heard the audible voice of God. But when you read the Bible, you're listening to God. When you sit there and you're writing in your journal or just doing something on your smartphone that's making you reflect, that's listening to God. And God can give you impressions. So that's one of my favorite attributes, just learning to listen. Just like taking a deep breath, turn off the TV, all your media stuff, all your so Not that that's bad, but you're just taking time just to listen. That's what I said in my whole transition was his will, my future his timing, my trust. That's what I heard from the Holy Spirit is I just sat quietly at the Jesuit center. It was just, that's a powerful, I hope everyone captures that, right? Um, Don't you think that is one of the lost 
um, spiritual practices. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Solitude. I, I think if you, when you say, what are the spiritual disciplines? Well, praying, fasting, reading your Bible, sharing your faith, and those all are. Mm-hmm. But what about just solitude? I remember you saying it powerfully. Like I, you know, I, I was at GT probably 25 years, 20 some years before we ever instituted a sabbatical policy. Mm-hmm. I remember like hearing your story and you can share a little bit about it. Like you had your first sabbatical, I think it was your first, maybe your second, but it was like you, what a powerful revelation to you, that intentional pause, like where you just hit the pause button and you just say, I'm going to hear from God, not work, not family, not career, just me and you, Jesus. I'm just going to take this intentional time to be and listen to you. And it's hard because when you're not wired to slow, right? Like it goes against everything in you when you are a driven person, when you are busy and sometimes you lose, um, yeah, sometimes you just, you start to form your identity around what you do. Mm -hmm. It is so hard to just shut it all off and to get away. I remember the first time I did an like full day silent retreat. I don't think about that. Oh my goodness. Like I would never, ever, and I had to build up to that, right? I had to like, okay, let me just sit for an hour. But then that was a big step to just go away for an entire day, not talk to anyone, just be, just sit outside in nature and just listen to God. And that is like, I think we get so busy that the noises of the world, we, the voices in the world and the noise of the world just drowns out the voice of God. And unless so we're true. intentional, we, then so again, it keeps us on the surface. It keeps us and robs us from what God really has for us. So when we cry out like, God, what's your will for my life? Or God, why aren't you answering my prayer? Or God, like he's trying, but you're not you're not lowering the volume or silencing the volume to yeah. really be able to hear. And so establishing those disciplines is huge. Yeah. And there's different seasons in life where you're raising kids and you're mowing the grass yeah. and you're going to baseball games and you're working a full-time job. I remember specifically at times getting up early just to have quiet, mm-hmm. just see the sunrise come up and just like have a cup of coffee and sit there and just think, I mean, you're right. That is a lost discipline in the church. And I, for those who are listening, no matter where you are in your faith, um, even people that don't know God, like just to take that moment for quiet. I What I used to say to, to people way back before we even wrote follow was, you know, we think about fasting, abstaining from food. Well, what about abstaining just f- for Facebook for a week? Or don't turn your TV on for one week. Or just like you said, imagine how many people have never had one day of just being silent. Yeah. How hard that is, yeah. but yet how powerful it is. Yeah. There's a book that you... Um, I read when I was on my sabbatical called replenish and I think you're reading it now. Yeah, it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just about done with it. Such a good book, but also there's a book called sacred slow. And there's um, a book called emotionally healthy discipleship that right. teaches you how to, to, to establish some of those rhythms. Cause that's what it's about, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's life is different. So just yeah. how do you establish a rhythm in your life that is healthy and that helps, helps you to continue to grow in your, in your walk and in your relationship with Jesus. Yeah, well, that, that's a great transition to the next attribute of learning to heal, mm-hmm. uh, because we often, again, get, we think when we say healing, at least I'm telling where my head goes, it's laying hands on the sick and physical healing. But you just said something earlier. What about emotional healing? Mm-hmm. What about physical healing? What about just trauma that you've been through in your life? Uh, and sometimes healing, don't take, uh, those listening, don't take it the wrong way, but healing becomes more about us. Mm-hmm. And that's not, that, healing is God's idea. And so that emotional healing of just like, and that's why we put it early and follow because we're doing it with God. You know, the disciples didn't have the power to heal, but with Jesus, he was going to give them that ability to not only lay hands on the sick, but think of the conversation that Jesus had with so many people, just his words brought the Greek word is sozo. It brought wholeness. It brought healing. The woman with the issue of blood, yes, the blood stopped and she was healed, but he said, I've made you whole. You are, it's sozo. You are, you have total wholeness. That's emotional and physical. And so I -hmm. love uh, that attribute as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, The next one is influence, you know, learning to influence. And we, Daniel and I both talked about like that word, you know, we're never going to save anybody. We're going to plant seeds. We're going to share our faith, tell our story. We're going to pray for them. Um, and the Bible says it's not who waters or sows the seed. It's God who gives the increase. So, 
but we have influence, whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, we either have good or bad influence. Mm -hmm. And so we are influencing people with our faith. We want our faith should be attractive to people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes again, the church complicates and, and the church, like one of our values at GT, I love it. It's like, what, what are, we're for you. It's what we're for, not what we're against. Many times the church is known for what they're against and you can't do this and you can't do that. And boy, don't, you know, that is, that is so uninfluential. In fact, it influences people away from God. Yes, it does. And so learning to influence. And then again, the resource in the back, we're all wired different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of us, you know, it's, it's relational, it's conversational, it's testimonial. That's what mine has always been. I'm, I'm very relational and very testimonial. I'll tell you my story as well. I don't have a story like that. Well, maybe you serve, maybe it's just being hospitable with people and being kind, which is a rare commodity in our world. So uh, that's another great chapter of learning to influence for sure. I think one of the best, um, one of the best um, encouragements or compliments you can receive from somebody is when they look at you and they say, what's different about you, right? right? Because there's a joy about you, or there's just a, an exceptional kindness about you. There's just something that makes them lean in. And what an incredible opportunity to then share your faith. But sometimes you're absolutely right. Like if our fruit stinks, if we're yep. just like, we, I always say like, walk around, you, you know, you walk around looking like you're weaned on a pickle. You're just like, yeah. And so unapproachable. Nobody yep. wants that. That's right. So how can we live our lives? And I'm not saying everybody has to be bubbly and, you know, like, ah, uh, I, I don't mean right. that, but just, are you kind? Do you have grace? Are you forgiving? Are you loving? And sometimes we're not because we're broken, right? right? Because we need healing. We need that emotional healing, especially coming off of the year that we just came off of just one trauma after, after the other. And so how do we, I think this is something that is so important is, really taking the time to learn how to heal so that you don't wound others because you're broken, right? Yep. Like that's right. such a, an important part, like dig deep, heal, right. so that then you can be more influential, influential and people look at you and say, I want to know more about that Jesus, right? Right. That's such a powerful truth you just shared. And I know you love food and you love to cook. The Bible says we're the aroma of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so what aroma, it's not always like, quoting the Bible and taking them down the Romans road. And you know, the Bible says, I mean, that's a part of it at some point, but it's just the way you live. It's people saying, I don't know, well, the more I look at Christine and Jim, I look at their, what, what's different about them? You know, uh, it's that that's the aroma that you're giving off. And that's because God's healing our brokenness. And that's a powerful, powerful truth. And again, I think we just have to broaden our understanding that healing is God's idea. And healing is more than just being healed of a sickness or a cancer. And, and God certainly does that. And he wants us to be a part of that. But there's a lot of healing that I think the church doesn't even talk about enough. Yeah. And that's important. Um, I know for me, the most important chapter, and I remember taking my boys through this. I thought, man, I could, if you know, the, you win the whole world and lose your own soul or you don't disciple your own kids. I took our boys through it. My boys were like, well, why do we have to go through it? You wrote the book. You know all about it. I said, okay, I'll go with that. But I want you to know about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful chapters in the book for me personally was learning to love. Uh, and I know I've talked about this before on this vodcast. I've talked about the fact that I didn't grow up like great parents, whatever, but we didn't know God. And so I, I just never felt like fully accepted. And there's a great quote. I'm going to read it. It's on page 137 of the second edition. It's from McGee's book. Um, the search for significance. And who isn't searching for that? And he writes this, I'll never forget reading it. I am deeply loved. I am completely forgiven. I mean, do you know how many people don't feel completely forgiven? Mm -hmm. You don't know what I've done, Brian. You don't, I, that's right, I don't. But God does, and he paid the price. Completely forgiven, fully pleasing. I didn't think that my life pleased my parents all the time or pleasing the teacher. I didn't do good enough for the coach or fully pleasing, totally accepted by God. I mean, to be deeply, you know, completely, fully, th that, the learning to love, again, it really goes back to what you just said. We can't express the love of God to others that he has for them if we haven't fully embraced how much he loves us. Yeah. So this chapter is so powerful. It really, really is. I, I think that and I know you've talked about it, but maybe for those who hadn't heard in the past, maybe talk about like the performance lie or that, that 
how that has deeply impacted you. Yeah. I mean, you know, my dad was raised seven brothers and not the greatest upbringing. Great mom loved him. Dad played favorites, whatever. Uh, and, you know, I, I know I've talked to one of our elders, Jim Comenzo. Each generation generation tries to do better than the last generation with or without God. My dad certainly did. Yeah. I mean, my dad was there for me, supported me, got off work to be at my games, coached a lot of our teams. But my dad had just this thing about like, I could play a great game. We would go, we'd come home from the game. We would go through all nine innings. My mom used to say, Ted, he's got to go to bed. He's got school tomorrow. We'd go through every inning. And I just had to, and again, a lot of it was just with me. I just felt like it didn't matter how good I did. There was always going to be something I didn't do right. And so many people, and again, I love my dad. My dad is an amazing dad and he's come to Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my sister and I, there's like a lot of healing that's taken place in that. But I just grew up with like this, like, nothing ever do is good enough. And that really kind of motivates you to keep whatever, but it can be a really like binding thing in your life. Mm-hmm. I, I remember early in ministry. I really do believe that I felt like I'd be heartbroken. Someone left the church and I couldn't, you know, uh, so you, we really just got to get to the point where it's not, again, what we do. It's not my effort. It's not my batting average. It's not the raise I got, or I'm not a good enough mother. Oh, my parenting. No, I, I am who God made me. I am totally accepted by him. I'm totally, completely forgiven. And I'm deeply loved. And that's just, and I had to, that quote, that quote for that, I put on my refrigerator for like a year. Yeah. I'd go to get my breakfast and think, you know what, Brian, just remember that God deeply loves you. You're completely forgiven. And I mean, I was in ministry for a decade already or more. So um, that's a powerful thought. It is. Because we have an enemy that wants us to believe that we have to do more in order to be loved more. Yep, and yep. that's not the heart of God, right? There's nothing we could ever do or say that would make God love us more. We are, we are made in his image right? and he is perfect and complete. And so therefore we are as well. And uh, what an incredible gift, but it's and a tough corporate, one. Yeah. And on a corporate level, we've often said it like, if, if you're looking at GT as the perfect church, guess what? Just keep looking because we're not it. In yeah. fact, and if we were and you walked in, you'd really mess it up. So <laughs> then you should find a different anyway. So yeah. it's corporate, it's individual and uh, that learning to love. And that and see, when you really feel that, that's what helps a church not saying, we don't look like me. You don't talk like me. Did you just say a curse word? Your hair's to this, your hair's to that. No, you accept and love others because you have felt what that feels like. And so you, you appreciate people that don't know God or they're new in their faith. And so... It's so good. Um, Learning to pray, another great attribute. Um, Again, it's where people feel overwhelmed. I don't know how to pray. Mm -hmm. I know for me, for example, I love to be in the word. I would study for like an hour when I was a new Christian and I'd pray for maybe 10 minutes and I'd think, well, okay, what do I keep praying about? So just learning to pray, taking us through the Lord's prayer and just using that as an outline, um, powerful, the whole spiritual warfare piece. It's a big part, but that's a great attribute. And the last attribute is right, learning. Before you move on, to that, I'm going to show you this. So, and this, I did this. This oh, is yeah. another one of your, um, your studies. It's called Prayer, the Splendor Nerve of Power. And um, this was so good. You can see my, my kids were little when I was going through this. So this oh, is, how cool, is that? how cool is that? This was so huge for me because I was so overwhelmed. I would hear people at the church pray. I would hear you pray. And I would think to myself, I can never pray like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and and through this study though, it was, you know what prayer is just, and even in follow talks about that prayer is just a conversation between you and God, right? He wants you to be real. He doesn't want you to pray like the, you know, King James version, thou art, you know, all this fancy stuff. Yeah. Just share your heart. He loves, you're his child. He loves to hear your voice. And that was so helpful and freeing to me. Um, but still very scary to pray out loud in front of yeah. people still to this day, I'm apprehensive. I'm like, ah, you know, um, right. but that holds people back sometimes. Don't you think from like having oh. a really rich prayer life? It totally does. Cause you know, you've been in the church a while, you know, obviously you're praying the word, but you hit it spot on. And I would often say like, it's not, Oh God, master of the universe. And we <laughs> make our voice tremble. And it's like, Oh my goodness. You know, it's just, it, that's exactly what prayer is. I mean, the example in the Bible where the tax collector is praying mm-hmm. and he's saying, God, like he's just humble before God and saying, please forgive me. And the Pharisees over there with his hands raised, who do you think God really heard? Mm. again, like healing, like all of this, it becomes more about us mm. and us impressing others rather than impressing the audience of one. It's God. Yeah. 
God, listen, no matter how wonderful we'd pray, we're talking to God Almighty. So mm-hmm. what you said, just praying like in a conversation to say, God, I don't understand. God, I feel down today. I just, I need your help today. Just like you're talking to a good friend that you totally trust yeah. that really accepts you, even in light of your mistakes or your failings. And that's such a powerful truth. And, and that's can be real. Sometimes our prayers aren't, oh God, I love you. You're great. Like sometimes my prayers are loud yeah. and sometimes right. my prayers are raw yeah. and you know what I mean? Because it's just, sometimes I just need to say, right? Like sometimes I scream when I pray. Sometimes yeah. I say, what is going on? Like, why? Yeah. That's right. Like, that, those are real prayers, right? You better so believe it. I, I'm telling you right now, if you'd have heard King David pray, David, the laments, the Psalms are like, you're good to other people, God, but what about me? Hmm. You've helped him, but why am I running from Saul? Why, why are you not helping me, God? He would lament before God. And I, again, I used to always say too, back in the day, I'd say, you know, people want prayer like a check mark. Oh yeah. I prayed today. Like, Oh God, I'm really tired. So forgive me of my sins. You know, it it needs to be passionate. It needs to be specific. Mm -hmm. God, I sinned today. The way I responded to my kids today was wrong. And God, tomorrow I need to go to my boys and say, guys, you need to forgive me because I, I didn't react to you the right way. And I'm sorry. Our boys need to hear, our kids need to hear that. And so that's prayer. That's Mm -hmm. prayer that God will bless and that he will help us. It's not just, oh, it's all my needs and help me get a new this and get a new that. That's, he cares for us, but it's, it's, it's like, it's the slender nerve of power. It's like a diamond. It's confession. It's intercession. It's adoration. There's all these aspects of prayer that you just take time with God and you don't have to have it. Many times I always read and pray with my Bible open. And I'll read something that really speaks to me. And I'll say, oh my goodness, I don't do that. Yeah. I didn't do that yesterday. Mm. God, please. I, I'm, I wasn't humble yesterday, God. Mm. I had an attitude. Mm. So it's just that intermixing of talking and listening and being with God. It just, yeah. it all works together. You, I hope parents that are listening didn't miss what you just said, because I think that is, and I probably learned this from you. Um, as a parent, we blow it a lot, right? <sighs> yeah. And again, especially after this past year of all of the different hats, my kids are grown now. And so my heart just broke and went out too. And I prayed for parents like never before, because in this season, especially with all of the trauma and all of the stress, I am sure (laughs) that there were a lot of times and still to this day are a lot of times where you lose it. You just lose it. But one of the most powerful things that we can do is take our children together to the foot of the cross and say, you know what? Mommy blew it today. Like I used to, I I tell people all the time when my, I was just talking to somebody about this earlier. When, when my kids were young, they would push my buttons. And there were times where this monster would, it was like, I was having an out-of-body experience and I would just watch this monster emerge. Sweet Christine, bubbly, fun Christine became a maniac, right? And there were times I just really, I mean, I would grab my kids at the, and I would, I would gather them together and I would sob and I would say, mommy blew it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said what I said or done what I like, please, please forgive me. And then let's pray because, and I would want them to hear me ask for forgiveness and ask for a new start because I wanted them to see that God is is a God of new beginnings and he's a God of forgiveness and a God of love. Um, That's, that's incredible. Your kids will never forget. I remember times I would do that. My boys would say, dad, no, that's all right. I said, no, you know what? It's not all right. And that's yeah. why I want you to hear that I am really sorry that I reacted to you that way. Mm-hmm. That's powerful. Our kids will never forget that. And yeah. when they're raising their children, it's just going to help them. And so it's powerful. Yeah. Oh, uh, the last attribute then is learning to manage. And um, it's, it, it's interesting. We use that term like, well, stewardship or we're stewards and that's good. But, you know, your mind, your money, your body, your words, your time, your gifts, I mean, God has blessed us with so much. And again, we can be overwhelmed. Like, yeah, I don't have enough money and I don't have any gifts and I don't know God. No, we do. And we've got to, we've got to manage that. And so that starts by understanding how God's blessed you. And then how can I put it into use? And again, this is where it really is affected in the corporate, in the church world, not just the individual, like where, you know, we believe in how many times, like you, you said it about Sunday and I was really honored by that. When I saw Pastor Swank, he gave me an opportunity. I was raw, man. I didn't, I was pretty new in the Lord. And I, I could tell you things I said in my sermons, just figures of speech that were like, 
his eyes would go like that. But he gave me that opportunity. Uh, he was a keychain leader. He said, hey, here are the keys. I know you're young. You're going to, uh, and we need to be that way. We need to manage our things personally, but as leaders, we need to do that as well. So uh, mm. yeah, that was really, uh, that was, an, I think it's just an important tool that God blessed us with over the years. And uh, you've taken hundreds of people through it. And uh, I would encourage any listener, you know, we always start with first steps. This is what we, this is kind of the introduction. The same thing as in the introduction of follow for everyone that gives their heart to Christ, whether online or in person, we get them a copy of this and it just helps them take those first steps that um, you're not going to have it all figured out. I've been at it for over 40 years, probably don't have it all figured out, but God's faithful. Yeah. I remember hearing somebody say following Jesus makes your life better and it makes you better at life. Wow. And I was like, that's so good. And I think when you apply the seven attributes of a follower of Jesus that, that are in your book, it really does help you to get better at life. Like you just said, manage. I mean, all the resources in that section alone at the back of the book regarding learning to manage right. are practical, tangible tools where you're right. able to actually figure some stuff out, get some things in order or learn about some walkaways because yeah. it goes back to influence too, right? The more the more peace we have in our lives, the more that, of that sozo wholeness that we experience because yep. we've done the work. We've actually, we've, we've spent our time with Jesus and we've, we've listened and gotten away with him. And, and then we start to put some, some really good biblical principles into our lives. We become more attractive. Somebody right. said once Ed, that you may be the only Bible somebody reads. Well, they only want to read the Bible of, you know, because they, they see something different and they see the peace that comes from, um, from, from knowing Jesus. And, and right. also, and it's not that you have everything figured out, right. And you have your life all together, no. but they see you trusting him in the midst of it all, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the turmoil, in the joy and in the sadness, they so see true there's something different about you. And there's something, there's something about Jesus that, that just, they want, they want to know more. And that's why we're on this earth. When people talk about what's my purpose, right? Right. Right. Your, your purpose is to help people find and follow Jesus when it comes right on down to it. That's right. In the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, after the accident, people have often said, Brian, you're so inspirational. You're so this, but I said, that's only because of God, because no matter what you face, uh, I'll say this to you, Christine too. And it's just something I've witnessed in your life. You are a very self-aware person. And I want to go back to the resources because it's more than just memorizing scripture and learning how to pray. Like in that learn to love chapter, there's great inventories back there for you to really rate yourself on do I really accept God's acceptance? Have I really forgiven myself? And you've worked hard as a, a believer and just hearing you talk about how you would, you know, tell your kids you're sorry, that's a self-aware person. And so I think follow does really help, not only help you grow in Christ, but grow in your understanding of yourself and how you were raised and those, you know, I go back to kill the spider, those lies that we believe that just really follow us, even after we're a Christian. Mm -hmm. Yes, God's forgiven us, but do we really know that? Do we live like we're really forgiven? Do we really live like we're deeply loved or, you know, fully pleasing? Or is it always in the back of my mind? Well, God, eh, he puts up with me, but I don't know that he, and you've been a great example of that. And uh, I just want to encourage our listeners that take time in the back of the book and do that because it'll really help you in your self-awareness of who I am as a person. I love that you said that. And thank you. That is a huge compliment. It's something that I work on every day. And what I've found is the more self-aware that I become, the more compassion I have for myself. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I start to realize like sometimes it's just being aware of certain triggers that stem from things that happened in my childhood. Right. right? Or right. there are certain things about my personality that I don't want to use as an excuse to devalue or to hurt people. So it's being aware and when those things come up and creep up in my life, I'm able to go, oh, that's why I responded that way. Right. And now I can have some compassion for myself and I can care for myself better. And then I can go back and make it right. But it, it also, I think when we are self-aware and we have self-compassion grace, yep. right? We extend that. You said that earlier, right? I was going to say that. And I've watched you do that. Like whether it's to whoever it is, when you have some compassion for yourself, it's a lot easier to give that to someone else than people who are self-righteous and deny that they really have that. And, oh, I got saved 20 years ago, whatever. But then they judge others. Yeah. I was just going to say the same, 
way you've done that with yourself, then I've seen you extend that to others. And that's a natural, that's an overflow of what God's done for you. So okay, true. Well, let me, let me now put it back on you because one of the things I've loved about you and your leadership, a lot of times when, it, cause I, I talk with ministry leaders all over the, the country and, and you are, you're like a unicorn, seriously. Wow. Um, you really are in, in your leadership style, in the way that you empower people in your team um, approach and also in your humility, because I know that there's been times we had an agreement long ago that we would say the hard things, yep. right? Yep. And one of my, the most admirable things about you is your willingness to take a deep look inside of yourself and your self-awareness. And then not only willing to look inside, but willing to be called out, right? Yep. I, there's been times where I've come to you and I've said, hey, can I just can I share this with you? Can I tell you like what I observed and, and given you feedback and you have received that feedback. Mm -hmm. And then I've watched you then work on it, you know, like just say, okay, I'm not just going to be aware of it, but I'm actually going to, going to, going to work on it. And then you would tell on yourself publicly, like, Hey guys, this is something that I know that I struggle with, with, and I'm going to need y'all to hold me accountable. And right. that is a sign of an incredible leader and an influ and an influencer. And um, so thank you for that. Cause you, you modeled that and. It really affects the culture. Yeah. I knew that if the culture of our staff, our church was to be, you know, Hey, we're for you and we're not against you. That's what God says about us. Like, then how could we do any different? And it's right. I mean, I remember years ago, we did the 360 evaluation where those that were your peers, those that you served under, those that served under you, you got feedback. And yeah. I, I remember thinking it wasn't my heart to seem like, oh, Brian, Brian plays favorites. That was one of the feedbacks I got. And I thought, okay, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But but you know, maybe people I don't work with closely every day, like certain people on staff, I could see how they feel like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's go go to lunch once a week and let's talk. And yeah. that's such good things. It's not always a negative, it just makes you a better leader, a better person. It makes you more self-aware. Mm -hmm. And again, none of us are going to ever be perfect, but I think the day we stop striving to be a better person, uh, that's, that's not good for others. I can tell you that. That's right. Let's, let's start with that. The first rung on that ladder of the Beatitudes, poor in spirit, right? Like, let's, exactly right. I stink. I need your help, God, right? Like, let's all that's just right. live like that. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> I'm so, loved, but I know that I blow it. And so God help me. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one example, people always tease about having the spiritual gift of sarcasm. And I got called out on it one time and it was so true that, yeah, I'm used to that locker rooms. Yeah. Just whatever. I don't mean it in a harsh way, but a person who's wired a little different could be very hurt by mm -hmm. a statement. I say, so going back to this, I have to manage my words. Yeah. I, I just can't be too, you know, loose or too whatever, joking around and, oh, they laugh at what I said, but that person was kind of hurt by it. That We just have to be mindful of that stuff for sure. I love that. Well, I just encourage all of you who are listening, whether you have read follow in the past or um, or not, grab a couple books, grab a friend, go through it together. You will, your life will be changed. Your life will be transformed because it's based on the word of God. It's not Brian, you know, it's like, it's based on the word of God and just really incredible biblical tools that will help you um, just really experience that, that sozo, you know, that wholeness. Um, so, so good. Brian, your fingerprints, are all over GT. We love you so much. I love you so much. I'm so thankful for your friendship and your leadership for all of these years. We're going to miss you, but I have a feeling you'll be back on this there podcast. We'll, be, we'll be keeping in touch and, and, and just, you know, yeah, I think everybody is going to want to track with you because I know everybody's cheering for you, praying for you, I believing feel. God's best for you. Um, so, for too. Yeah. We just love you so much. So thank you for spending some time with us today. And thank you all. Uh, thank you for all that you've done at GT. And because your follow is part of our whole discipleship pathway. It's how we help people learn how to follow Jesus. And um, and so that that will uh, impact generations. And, and what a legacy that is, as we talked about that at the beginning. You, you've lived it out. And we're so thankful. 
Um, all right. Well, if you missed, again, if you missed Brian's celebration service this past Sunday, you can always go back and you can watch it on our website or our YouTube channel. And don't forget to download the GT Church podcast so you don't miss out on any of our sermons or our Growing Together episodes. Thanks again for joining us today. I'll see you next week for the episode of Growing Together with Pastor Dan Sarna, where we'll be discussing his Palm Sunday message of what is real truth.